Hello and welcome everyone. My name is Golda Lee Bruce and I am a development storyteller in the Caribbean Country Department of Inter-American Development Bank. Welcome to our webinar on the future of festivals. It's part of a series here called the Pivot Series. Uh, we're thinking about where we should be after COVID and long into the future. So the future of festivals. Today is June 9th and it's a day when under normal circumstances, uh, the people of Bermuda would have been preparing for the Heroes Weekend and the people of St. Vincent and, and the Grenadines would have been stepping their preparations into high gear in order to be ready for Vinci Mass in a couple of weeks and then on to St. Lucia and then to crop over in Barbados. But instead, planes are grounded, hotels are empty, and even if we wanted to parade in the street, we'd have to do it six feet apart. So there are many things to talk about here, and we've invited a panel from across the region, uh, festival stakeholders from across the region, to share their expertise and their ideas with us. The big question is, can we change the way we celebrate to adapt in a changing world? So allow me to introduce to you our panelists for today, and our panelists are Kamal Banki. He is the chairman of the Jamaica Sports and Entertainment Network, a special committee established by the government of Jamaica. Welcome, Kamal. Carol Roberts, she is the Chief Executive Officer of the Barbados National Cultural Foundation, the organization that executes the world famous Crop Over Festival. Valmiki Maharaj, Maharaj rather, is the band leader of the Lost Tribe, among many other roles within the Tribe Carnival Group, one of Trinidad's premier carnival bands. And also welcome to my colleague Vashti Duki Singh, who is a senior specialist at IDB Lab. Welcome to you all. It's so great to have you here to have this discussion with us. Thanks for inviting me. <laughs> Thanks, Gola. Well, happy to be here. <laughs> I'm happy we're all here. And I'm just going to ask you to, you know, stay off of mute. Um, that awkward mute moment sometimes gets, <laughs> that awkward unmute moment sometimes gets in the way. And we really want to keep the conversation rolling. So just to let those of you who are joining us know that um, we are inviting your questions and your comments, your ideas all throughout this forum. We'll be checking in with you to see where your mind is at and also to pose some of those questions to our panelists. So please interact with us, um, get the chat going. A lot of times, guys, you'd be surprised to find out that there's a completely different discussion happening in the chat, but we, we oftentimes use that chat to inform our messaging and our work moving forward. So I've asked the panelists to prepare um, a quick introduction to get our conversation going, and I've, I've give, given them some questions to answer. So Kamal, I want to get going with you. Um, sure. You've been very busy over the last couple of weeks. Um, you recently presented a report to the government of Jamaica on the way forward for the sports and entertainment sector post-COVID. Um, yes. Tell us about how stakeholders in Jamaica in particular are planning to rebound. Okay, so uh, morning, everybody. Um, so here's the thing about Jamaica. Jamaica is, you know, like most other places in the Caribbean, somewhere that socializing is second nature to us. I mean, you know, liming, as you call it in Trinidad, parring, as you call it in Jamaica. Um, you know, for me, what's important is that people really just want to gather and be around each other, right? So the first thing that we looked at is, okay, what is the, you know, quantum of where the industry is now, like, you know, before pre-COVID and you say, okay, well, how many events do we have per year? Um, the number is about 20,000. We have about 20,000 on average events per year um, in Jamaica from small, you know, round robins, um, small events, less than 500 people, then, you know, medium size, you know, 500 to 5,000. And then of course, all the way up to big festival status, um, you know, those big events and sporting activities and so on. So you're going to say, how are we going to pivot and how are we going to move? And, and the notion really, and the presentation was really about what can we do now based on the current guidelines that are, you know, laid out in terms of social distancing and, you know, that kind of stuff. One of the most important things to understand is that we in Jamaica understand that there is you know, a major festival and then there are small events. One of the things that COVID has taught us is that gathering large groups of people right now is impossible for a couple of reasons. A, most of our major festivals are 50-50 tourists and locals. Tourists are not coming here. So that leaves you with 50% of your, you know, potential patronage not able to participate. 
then of course you say, okay, how comfortable are people going to be, you know, moving out into the world and, you know, participating and rubbing shoulders with each other. One of the first things to consider is that instead of doing one large event for 10,000 people, you're going to have to do maybe 20 events for 500 people um, in the, you know, phase one um, to make the same amount of revenue. So it's going to require you to do many more smaller events um, that, you know, cumulatively will make up the 10,000 event that you probably used to do once or twice per year um, to actually have the same amount of revenue and, and, and driving the economic activity. So I believe that you're going to see a lot more smaller events popping up um, on that micro level. And then people are going to be much nimbler in terms of how they produce these things. Um, you're going to see a lot of the niceties stripped down. Um, the frills, those kinds of things are not going to be as necessary as possible because really we just want to get back out there and hang out with each other. Events like, you know, what we would call um, tailgates or stuff like that, those are going to be things that people are going to consider now um, as viable because, you know, it's, it's a large square footage of space. And when you look at a large square footage of space, you're going to try and, you know, put the people in there in a very safe way spacing out bathrooms, bathroom attendance, safety protocols, temperature checks, um, masks, definitely for staff and patrons and stuff like that. And those are some of the, you know, top of the line things that, you know, from a pivot perspective, you know, we all will have to do um, to make it through and continuing move, to move the industry forward. Thanks, Kamal, for that. Um, quite a few things to talk about there. Um, the one that comes to mind immediately is, is the sort of assumption that um, things will return to what we knew before COVID. But I'm going to stick a pin and allow Carol um, to tell us about some very tough decisions that she's had to uh, have been a part of over the last couple of weeks. Um, the Crop Over Festival and the National Independence Festival have been cancelled for 2020, but they're being replaced by a national training program in Barbados. Carol, tell us about the goal of that training program and, and what you're hoping to achieve there. Thank you very much and good morning again to everyone. Yes, uh, I think you've put it quite succinctly. Um, tough decisions, uh, the major one being the decision by Cabinet to cancel Crop Over. Um, and I would want to start by putting that in perspective. Uh, like and I think what will happen during our hour-long discussion will be the acknowledgement among us, the presenters, that we have so much in common and, and, uh, and, and very little uh, that is, you know, um, particular or specific to, to an individual territory. Um, of course, it was in the, in the best interest uh, of the people of Barbados who, when you consider all of the options that you could have vis-a-vis -vis the Crop Over Festival, to cancel it for this year. Uh, like Kamal, as Kamal said, um, Barbados is very similar to Jamaica, where a huge percentage of the participants in the festival are actually visitors to the island. Uh, with our borders closed to non-essential travel, you can imagine what that impact or that, that lack of participation regionally and internationally would have had on the festival. I like to see opportunities in every challenge. And so, under the COVID-19 pandemic restrictions, uh, I think is presented a wonderful opportunity to take a step back, look at the state, not only of the festival, but of the sector, and come up with meaningful ways to one, support the participants, two, uh, examine and uh, identify gaps that are uh, quite prevalent and attempt to fill those gaps, uh, three, now that you have the time, carefully craft um, both uh, training and financial support so that participants in the sector, should this happen again, have alternatives to quite frankly earning a living. And at this point, again, I think this is what is happening across the entire region in carnival communities and in the, in the cultural sector. Artists just want to be able to live. They want to be able to eat, to pay their bills. Now, what does that have to do with the national training program? Uh, from a long-term perspective, a uh, long short-term perspective, the national training program allows us to be able to shore up the skills of the practitioners in our sector and get them ready for market. Some will say, yes, but we already, we're already ready for market. 
uh, in that case, we want you to redefine what you consider markets. We have less than 400,000 Barbadians. There are less than 10,000 people in the English-speaking Caribbean. But there are 360 million souls in West Africa. Is now the time to begin to look to take our art to that market, including our festivals? And I say, yes, now is the time. Now, for some, uh, we may not be moving as, as fast as they would like because crop over is canceled today. So what are you doing tomorrow? What are you doing next week? But I think the slow and steady um, or the sure and steady method is going to get us where we're supposed to be. Thanks, Carol, for that um, really good perspective there and gives us a lot to talk about. Um, Val, I'm going to come to you next for some introductory remarks. Uh, you represent Tribe Carnival, uh, one of the premier carnival bands and really known in Trinidad and Tobago and the Caribbean as a carnival innovator. Um, question for you is, can we innovate out of, how is Tribe planning to innovate out of COVID-19? I definitely think so. I think based on what Kamal and Carol said, I totally agree with their standpoint. From the onset of our lockdown and even before that, we have gone into a mode of scenario planning and scenario planning that is based on a platform of safety first. You know, before our, our festivals are based on a congregation of people, there is a spirit and an energy that comes from that, from our Caribbean people getting together that you cannot get in other situations when they're separate and they're apart. And we needed to, and we need to find ways to be able to, I think, analyze and break down our product, our experience, because that's what we sell. We sell experiences from each of our carnivals to a granular level and analyze ways that that can then be adapted to whatever this concept of new normal may be. Um, Carol spoke about uh, the foreign masquerader and the foreign, uh, foreign crowd as well. And we have been working a lot right now in terms of finding ways that if the borders were to remain closed for a longer period as well, how do we take the Caribbean to them? How do we keep them connected? How do we keep them inspired during this time that, you know, so much more is going on in the world apart from just this pandemic? Thank you so much for that, Val and Vashti. Um, you know, in our initial conversation, we were talking um, just before this webinar began about uh, one of the main challenges in terms of planning is being able to quantify the actual value of uh, the festival and the carnival industry or sector um, to the income of the region. So you know, um, tell us a little bit about what the IDB is doing there, the work of the IDB to support creatives in this regard. Okay, um, thanks Golda. Well, I think the IDB as a regional institution um, really started to make some strong strides looking at Caribbean specific data probably for the last five years. And, you know, if you look at our website, there've been quite a lot of publications that are specific to Caribbean people, to Caribbean businesses that probably weren't there before. Now, the issue with really quantifying the economic impact of festivals and carnivals really has a lot to do with the fact that this is not something that traditionally we have captured in our GDP as individual countries. I think largely because if we look at carnivals, if we look at major sporting events, if we look at any kind of festivals, there's a high degree of informality in terms of how those things get monetized. So if I were to look at Trinidad and Tobago, Sure, we can look at the number of visitors and maybe we can put an estimate to what they spend. But if we really drill down, it impacts not just hotels, it impacts private homes that may take in guests, the Airbnb we're not capturing, taxi drivers, the beauty and wellness industry, because everybody has to get ready, retail, restaurants, massage, um, for all the food and beverage providers, the events people, people that do decorating, all these people are engaged in services around these festivals. And we're not really able to quantify that in a very systemic way, the way that our countries collect data right now. 
because of the high degree of informality and because of the use of a lot of gig economy type work. And you know, a lot of this is short term contracts. People, it's very seasonal, but it makes an impact into the livelihoods of people. So one of the things we like to do as IDB Lab, I mean, we don't have the you know, status of our economics department, but we do work with our economics team. And what we like to do is when we look at problems like this, start looking at ways that we can collect some kind of proxy data. So what are the kinds of measures that we can look at that could approximate and get a more inclusive um, view of what's really happening in terms of the dollars and cents of these festivals, as well as what is the social impact of them? Because they're, they're intertwined, you know. So that, that is where I would just probably take a pause here and, you know, I'd be happy to come back to it or expand further and talk about other things as well. Thank you so much for that, Vashti. So I'm going to just throw the first question out there, which is um, sort of pulling from what Kamal and Val mentioned. Um, is the assumption that we are riding this, riding out this storm to return to what we knew before? Are we thinking that at some point in time over the next 12 months, maybe, um, Trinidad Carnival is going to be what it was last year and crop over is going to come with the same number of uh, tourist arrivals and, and international um, notoriety that it had before. Are we returning to, are, are we thinking that we're going to be returning to pre-COVID or are we looking at a completely different landscape for festivals and carnivals in the region? Kamal, I'm going to start with you. I mean, that's the million dollar question, Gola, to be honest. Um, the reality, though, is that, you know, what we're actually looking at is saying, OK, what is the consumer saying? And that's really where we have to listen to the people. Will the consumer be comfortable now, six months from now, 12 months from now, partying like they used to? And that has a lot to do with what the global health forecast is and the scenarios you know, can play out as follows. A, you can get a vaccine, everybody's vaccinated, and it's virtually eradicated like, you know, polio. Um, or um, you can look at where, you know, most of the world eventually gets um, COVID, and then we have herd immunity, and then it doesn't really matter anymore. Um, or um, the corona or COVID can die a social death, either a situation where nobody else gets infected um, over time you kind of stop the spread because if you know we're isolated and you know like new zealand has just done they've conquered the virus there's no more virus there um so you know other places in the caribbean trinidad barbados you know jamaica is on its way there to have zero new cases um, and if you're at that stage then there's no threat of gathering together um, also, a social um, death of the virus could mean nobody is really interested in the um, the threat of it anymore because it's not that serious or doesn't impact them emotionally to deter them from their daily life. So, it's one of those options could return to normalcy if you know there's a protracted period of 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 you know the virus continuing, you know, way into 2021 with the same potency, the same um, high death rates, then you may have um, to delay any of those four options for, for returning to normalcy. I believe right now we're in a stopgap period of time where, you know, we're just trying to make ends meet and pivot and, you know, do those things that can actually have us earning at a very similar level um, of where we were, um, albeit, you know, with some, um, you know, jumping through hoops. And then, you know, we get back to normal um, because that's, with it, the entertainment industry has evolved organically to what people really want it to be so you know we actually came to the place where we're like okay how do people want to enjoy themselves at carnival how do people really want to enjoy themselves at dream weekend or you know any one of the other reggae festivals and we built that product for them it was custom designed for how they want to enjoy it so to get back there is really playing into you know what the human 
nature wants the festival to actually be like, and that's really what we need to strive to, to accomplish. Thanks, Kamal. And um, before um, I go to Carol and to Val to talk about that assumption about returning to what what you call normalcy, um, just to, to throw something in here, um, a recent study commissioned by the International Air Transport um, Association, IATA, which questioned recent travelers in the U.S. and 10 other countries indicate that only about 14% of people would be willing to fly immediately once governments lift severe COVID-19 related restrictions. 40% of would-be passengers said they would not consider getting on a plane for at least another six months. So this is another factor here, the lethargy of, of tourists to fly, to come to the region and to celebrate with us in the way that they have before. So, so can we really be planning to return to what we knew before um, anytime soon? Carol? Yes. Um, no, I don't think we can. And uh, no, absolutely not. Absolutely not. I don't think we should. As I said earlier, we, we need to see this as an opportunity to step back, to review, reassess, recharge, very importantly, and repurpose and reimagine. All those reasons. I think uh, COVID-19 has given us uh, an opportunity to do that. Why? Because when you are producing, again, I'm sure Kamal and uh, Val, Val will be able to um, say yes to this. When you're producing a festival, you're dealing with a totally different set of dynamics. There's hardly enough time in every day, every month, every week uh, to get it ready for your public. And therefore, you have to make decisions very quickly and very serious decisions very quickly. This period should be allowing us or should be forcing us to be ready for next year. But what would next year's festival or even 2022's festival, because a festival in 2021 isn't 100% guaranteed, what should it look like? Um, and as we answer those questions by both, I agree with Kamal, listening to our consumers, but also being very clear as to the vision we want for this festival. And what, what I think we've discovered over time as you visit Carnival to Carnival in the Caribbean is year after year, less and less of the heritage components, the real underpinnings of the festival uh, are being lost because we seem to be pitching to the limer, the partier, and what quite frankly brings in the bucks and brings in the people. What COVID-19 is almost forcing us to do, two things, look at those heritage components and make them more meaningful, reimagine them, but also, consider the very real possibility of Caribbean collaboration. Because if you look at the festivals, they're almost along a continuum. I go down to Val in Trinidad early. I may hop over to Dominica, may go to Martinique. And then they pretty much line up all the way down uh, Vinci Carnival, uh, Lucian Carnival, Antigua, and there is Jamaica. You come down to crop over and then you go to Grenada, I think is the last one. So what are the possibilities? What are the possible synergies? How can we collaborate? And not so much to share carnivals among each other. I think that happens organically quite well, but to share this Caribbean experience with as much of the world as possible. And in order to do that, I don't see how we cannot begin to consider creatively put in this content on a digital platform. I'm glad that you mentioned that, Carol. Um, you segue quite nicely into this question about a digital platform that many, many people are already asking about in a um, Q&A function there. And that's a big question, right? And, and Kamal, you mentioned it earlier about the, the value that Jamaica derives when Beanie and Bounty have a versus clash with 500,000 people watching right? Um, is mm -hmm. there a way to monetize digital offerings um, to really lend themselves to this carnival festival revolution? So one of the things that, you know, a lot of people ask, and, and I mean, you know, I welcome the questions, but I always kind of meet it with, you know, metered, um, you know, kind of heaviness from my end. It's really just that we we look on festivals, carnivals, parties, and when I say parties, I mean large parties, um, different based on the entertainment offering. So 
if you have a stage show with live artists, um, let's be Billy Bounty, Sean Paul, Shaggy, Marshall, Bonji, Kess, you know, um, and of course you're looking on these kinds of large performers um, and they're performing on screen, um, you get the same vibe if you're sitting at home watching your TV um, as if you're literally in the crowd um, and looking at the stage. Um, it's the same presentation and it's kind of built for that audience theater style presentation, right? Now, when you're actually in a fete or you're marching down the road, tripping down the road um, at carnival, your environment is the performance. It's a 360 immersive activation. Um, and I mean, you know, even a 360 degree camera can't even really capture the energy and the vibe that you get from being immersed in the carnival um, because the performance is happening all around you at the same time. And you will never be able to replicate that particular aspect in a digital experience. Um, so there is kind of, you know, a disparity between what the digital experience is for our traditional performance driven um, stage shows um, from the kind of immersive experiential carnivals and fets and, and, and events, large events that you will have. I mean, you know, we have a lot of food festivals, coffee festival here in Jamaica. There's a lot of things that are experiential that you literally have to be there to experience it. Um, so the digital side can provide a small additional revenue stream for some of these, but it will never replace it because we also like to gather. And sitting on your living, in your living room watching other people gather um, kind of gives you FOMO as well. So... Uh, yeah. For me, I don't think it, it replaces it. It's just like a, a quick peek to whet your appetite to get back in the game. What I want to add to that is that, to my mind, Kamal, that, that's only one or a few aspects, because I agree with you totally. We are um, a people in terms of the Caribbean region who like to gather. We like a line. But there are other aspects of our carnival uh, and our other festivals that can be monetized and can be put on a digital platform. So whether it is basic costume making, whether it is uh, aspects of the culinary arts component of our festivals, uh, certainly for Crop Over, we also have a huge visual art and craft component to the festival. We have an exhibition, we have uh, a market specifically for art and craft and home decor items. Those are aspects that can be leveraged on digital platforms with digital market marketplaces, for example, uh, that can be more than just a little um, bit of viability for the practitioners who engage in that aspect. Of it. So yes, I agree with you. I'm just saying that, that what, what I'm saying is that we really need to sit down and rethink all of the aspects of the festival and their methods of delivery, their modes of delivery to the public. Thanks, Carol. Val, I really want to hear from you on this because I do remember being told once um, that Tribe does not sell costumes, it sells an experience. So what experience can be translated digitally given what both Kamal and Carol have said? Well, I have all kind of thoughts, I think, because I agree with you both of them on everything. <laughs> 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 on what level, I mean, Kamal painted a picture of uh, different scenarios. And I think we ourselves are not the same that we were three weeks ago. Our level of normalcy has already changed. So the festival is never going to be the same. But what the festival is, the way we communicate it, the way that we create an experience is going to be based on who the customer is. If the borders remain closed in Trinidad, our customer is going to be different. It might be the first time in any of our lives that we would have experienced a totally local carnival as the conversation seems to be starting and, and continuing right now. How do, we, how do we change our communication from something that was previously shaped to invite people towards Trinidad and Tobago to, I suppose, an explosion of patriotism and we are we carnival? How do you, as I said before, embrace through maybe digital platforms um, and engage the foreign market. And then further than that, somebody mentioned 2022 Carnival. 2022 Carnival is going to be vastly different from whatever we may or may not experience in 2021. So really and truly, we aren't even planning for one new normal, but a variety of them as the years progress. And I think that's the way that we really need to look at it. 
And I, I'd like to jump in and, and just to complement what has been said here. You know, at IDB Lab, we are supposed to be the innovation lab for the IDB group. And one of the things that we really push is this whole level of innovation. As COVID-19 has occurred in this black swan event, we're really looking at, like everybody else, how can digital technologies, how can digitization be curated in a way that is meaningful to different sectors in the economy? Now, some of them, it's an easier jump. But when we talk about festivals, as the panelists have pointed out, it's very culturally rooted, it's tactile, it's an experience. I don't think the idea is really to, as, as Carol has pointed out, is to replace those experience in the entirety. But I think that for the many small entrepreneurs and the, the, the individuals, small micro entrepreneurs, bigger businesses even that are out there, it's important to start really exploring different channels. And I think that if we go to the market with like everybody with their own little thing, I'm not sure that it ever will get the kind of traction that is needed. And this is where I think partnerships and collaboration to come up with solutions on how we tap into new channels, how we look and maybe look at different types of consumer bases. Of course, taking into consideration as well that all the economies of the world are, are in a very, quite a difficult place right now. Consumer spending is down. So how could this sector's creatives really kind of recurate something maybe in the short term, something in the medium term? and something for the longer term. So I don't think it's one solution, but I do think that we would be remiss just to write off digital channels and digital platforms, digital experiences completely. I mean, I totally got what you said about, you know, some of the stage performances, but I did read in Time Out UK that Glastonbury is now going with a virtual reality event for their festival this year. Right, so it's going to be done on a gaming platform that people can participate in a more submersive, a sub, not submersive. They can be more immersive. 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 I got it. You have to be very careful with your words these days. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> you know, there there is another angle that I just you know would probably like to throw out. You know, in the ways of innovation. I mean, coming out of COVID, we've seen a lot of movements. Maybe it's healthy food, it's save the environment, it's Black Lives Matter. It's lots of things have come to the fore because people have had time to reflect and really time to connect and to be present. How can we as creatives maybe do, take the festival experience and support some of these movements? That might be another idea. Thanks, so, Rashti. Uh, hold Thanks, on. I think what, um... Go ahead, Val. Sorry, I think both Carol and Vashti identified a theme of One Caribbean. And it's something that, you know, a lot of people had said in Trinidad in the early days. They say, oh gosh, all you're lucky, all you had a carnival before everything else get cancelled for the whole year. And we have experienced the effect of this pandemic on the Caribbean through our stakeholders, our producers. And so it would be naive after going through this for anybody to think that we are divided and we are one island, the next island. You know, it, it showed how the economies move and how the, the cash flows and how the experience flows from one island to the other. So I'm definitely open, Carol, to, to collaborating and working together and looking at us as an entity. Okay. Thanks for that, Val. Um, I, I do want to get to some of the questions that we have that are coming in from um, our participants. Um, and Carol, one of the first questions was for you and it had to do with this 
this training, this national training that right. Barbados is doing. It comes from Monica, who works with the National Arts Festival in South Africa. She asked. Mm -hmm. I saw that, and I, I actually responded um, by oh. typing. But go ahead, but go ahead. <laughs> no, <laughs> it was a well, good question. Please, we'd like to share the response with all of us. Um, she asked about the National Skill tra Skills Training Program. Is it focused on building the skill set to be successful in the creative economy on skills that can be applied elsewhere in the economy? Yes, and uh, my response to her, Golda, was yes to both. Of course, we are going to be putting a lot of attention, and we started already, on providing training via a digital platform across a number of, well, several disciplines in the arts and culture, including some disciplines that we would not have uh, brought totally under our umbrella in the past, including things like gaming and animation. Um, we, we're really trying to invest heavily in that. But also using training in the arts and culture across all areas of um, education and uh, training endeavors. So using the arts and culture to teach uh, civics, to teach uh, citizenship, to teach science, to teach mathematics. And we are in the process um, of rolling out uh, content for our Ministry of Education for students who will be sitting uh, CAPE and CXC. Uh, when I say in the process, we have already started delivering some content to the ministry. Um, but we are also very keen on providing training and, and, and once again, reimagining training. Yes, towards certification, but also just towards an enhancement of skills and knowledge in what I call some lost traditions and some lost arts, whether it be uh, legal practice. Just yesterday, I was speaking with one of my cultural officers, and he has a proposal to teach the art of uh, stained glass creation. Um, we used to have a very, very vibrant uh, pottery industry in Barbados, and we have been speaking to some artist tours reviving that. But not just providing training where you can say, yes, I can do this, but through our business development department and our ministry saying, yes, I now have this skill, how can I monetize it? Because I've got mouths to feed. Um, and that, that has been uppermost in the minds of everyone at the foundation and at our ministry. Um, uh, my minister is very, very adamant that there must be a meaningful link between heritage, culture, and the creative, the creative economy. And so the training program is going to, one, fill those gaps, provide the, the skills across a very broad spectrum, leading us to be able to say, look at this person, look at that person, look at this skill, do you want to buy it? Thanks, Carol. Um, another question from Ram, and Kamal, I'm going to throw this question to you first, at least. Um, <laughs> he talks about the, the prices for uh, tourists coming to Trinidad and Barbados in particular, for Carnival um, and, and saying, asking if there's any discussion about lowering the cost of specific Carnival or festival related services in the hopes of attracting incoming visitors after COVID. Um, is this something that we should be considering? Yeah, I mean, so to answer the question, I'm going to kind of give you a little bit of the history. So Carnival Please. in Jamaica was established um, in early 2017. I mean, obviously, you know, Jamaica Carnival, as everybody knew it or called it before, happened by various bands and practitioners putting on their events, their road marches, their fets, whatever, um, for 20, 25, 30 years. Um, and what we actually did in 2017 was brand it as Carnival in Jamaica and leveraged our, what you would call, international marketing partners to help drive it um, and grow it. So our carnival has grown um, exponentially through that. One of the ways that um, we've achieved this growth is looking at one of the, some of the key factors of production in terms of what makes a carnival product um, you know, viable or not, right? And you know, when you're looking at the road march and when you're looking at the FETs and those kinds of things, what are the factors of production that goes into the cost structure of these things? And then working with um, the government directly, security services, um, various agencies of the government, customs, um, agriculture with you know, importation of feathers, because we don't grow feathers here that you know, are suitable for the carnival costumes. Um, so looking at those factors of production 
and trying to remove the red tape, um, cut down on what the bands and the practitioners actually have to pay for um, in terms of producing their event or their road parade or those kinds of things to keep the costume prices um, you know, reasonable. And that also has been a major driving force for actually Carnival in Jamaica growing because we've, through public-private partnership, um, been able to keep the costume prices fairly reasonable. I mean, you can get um, on the lower end of the scale, um, you can get you know, a kind of full carnival costume with you know, a small backpack, feathers, body wear, et cetera, et cetera, for 320 US dollars, um, which is very, very reasonable. And once you're able to do that, the, the, the barrier to entry and the level of participation becomes broader. Um, if the prices were skyrocketing in terms of the factors of production, then each carnival costume would be costing $500 minimum, $700 minimum, and then turn off the potential customer um, from participating because we all know that there's an associated cost that we may not have control over. I mean, we can't control the price of Caribbean Airlines charges. Um, we do have partnerships with them for the past couple of years where they give discounts to revelers, but it helps. Um, and then, of course, hotel prices. You know, the hotel industry, they're making their money out of selling those packages to people. Um, the transport providers, we don't control these things. So we do what we can from our standpoint to keep the price kind of middle of the road so that people can still participate from the local scene and the international scene and you know, maintain you know, a good competitive advantage. I wanna ask a question from Kathleen and Kathleen is asking, assuming that the, the CARICOM region becomes COVID free, can we consider creating a Caribbean bubble to market our festivals? And this is kind of related to a point that was made in one of our previous webinars about creating COVID-free zones that we can still invite tourists to within the region. And this goes back to the point of uh, working together, as you guys mentioned before. What do you think about this thought, um, the ca carnival bubbles that are safe? Yeah. If, 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 may I answer? Golda? Yes, please. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yes, the, the idea of a, or the notion of a carnival bubble is quite doable, but it forces us to confront um, a question, uh, a scenario um, that I first had to confront uh, when I took over this post as CEO of the NCF in 2018. And that is, while we are collaborating, what makes each festival unique within its physical space. Because if you, if you look at it, uh, Kamal mentioned the whole question of the cost of costumes. We cannot get away from the fact that the costumes are generally, at the very basic level, all similar. They pretty much look all alike, certainly for the major, um, what in Barbados we call the party bands. So if I can buy my costume and my experience cheaper in jurisdiction A. What is going to make me go and pay for the same costume and the same basic kind of experience in jurisdiction B or C? Shouldn't there be something else in that experience that is unique to that country that makes me say, well, this year I'm going to go to Trinidad, Jamaica, and Antigua because you know I've been to Barbados or I'm going back to Barbados or I'm going back to Trinidad because I am guaranteed a good time. And those are some of the questions when we consider collaborations that we are going to have to confront and find meaningful answers to these questions. If I could jump in, Carol, I think um, what you're probably getting at here is that in the event that we were able to create this safe zone, you know, festivals have always been part of our tourism offering. And I think what would really make the, the experience different is if you come to Trinidad, if you go to St. Lucia, if you go to Barbados, what experience has been curated around that other than the core festival party experience that makes it different? So, you know, maybe in Jamaica, for example, 
it's, you know, a coffee festival, a rum festival, you have food festivals, you know, you have beautiful spots in, in Barbados. It's really how we package these things. And to do that successfully, in fact, to come out of this whole thing successfully, again, I think as we all recognize, easy to say, not so difficult, not so easy in practice, but we really have to come together and co collaborate. That doesn't mean that we wouldn't be competing against each other, but it means that we are trying to offer something to a region, recognizing that in the, this period of time, this is likely to be our market. How can we offer things that are different, link more to the culture, what the country offers, as yeah. well as the carnival experience, because you're absolutely mm -hmm. right. You know that, um, well, as a Trini, I have to say Trinidad Carnival is completely okay. different experience. <laughs> but, you know, my experience in Jamaica and Barbados has been very limited. So you'll excuse my lack of experience there. Can I Val, say didn't, a... Val didn't smile at that at all. Val. Well, here's an open invitation, Vashti. <laughs> <laughs> Can I say, you know, Carl, yes. you're definitely, you're in my head. And I think uh, the idea of uh, the One Caribbean Carnival, if each product is seen as things that stand right next to each other, the apples and oranges type of, type of thought, uh, it's not going to be that uh, one is better than the other or not the other. It's that they are different experiences altogether. And if I am to draw a parallel um, like to our own band, Tribe the Group, uh, that is actually the idea that has led to our innovations that now result in six bands. It started off as Tribe 16 plus years ago and recognizing that there were different experiences to be had and a different need from different you know, pools of masqueraders. We decided to take that and expand into Bliss and Lost Tribe and the Hearts Family and Pure and Rogue, etc., etc. Even in our, our Juve bands right now, uh, you know, we have several Juve bands that we are associated with because they offer you different vibes, different actual tangible products on the road as well. So to one hand of it, you know, you, if you have music and costumes and feathers, but really and truly, if we are to reduce Carnival as its essence to music and trucks and drinks in a, in a cup on the road, I mean, you would have done an injustice to everything that we are doing here right now. Agreed. Yeah, one, one of the things that I, you know, kind of wanted to think about is what's the differentiating factor between all of us, right? And use that as the way actually to link all of us, right? So in Jamaica, we did not try to be, in terms of the holistic carnival experience, we didn't try to be another Trinidad or another Krakova. We're like, okay, those guys have that covered. What is carnival in Jamaica actually going to look like in terms of the product and develop that? So what does that actually look like now? When you come to carnival in Jamaica, you're able to go to the dance hall street parties um, every night of the week, um, which is unique because that's our Jamaican culture. And yes, we have a lot of dance hall and reggae playing on the road in our carnival. So even the road experience is different. You're able to pop out and go to Bob Marley Museum, immerse in that culture, um, run over to Duns River Falls, head over to Maiden Key, Helcher and eat some fried fish, go up to the Blue Mountains and you know, drink the coffee up there. And there's all of these peripheral experiences that you get when you're here that, you know, whether, whether it is in Trinidad and you're immersing in the Soka Monarch and the Calypso Monarch and the Pan culture and the heritage aspect of Barbados or so on and so forth. There's a lot of micro experiences that you're able to have with different countries that allow those countries to stand on their own and also work together because, yes, the homogenous product is you know the trucks and the and djs and 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 the rum but of course carnival is much broader than that you're immersing and living in a country for a week and then you have to do everything and it's not just you know party 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 24 sevens you have to eat every day you have to you know have some kind of cultural immersion you have to socialize and how do you bring all of that together and make sure that each product is properly differentiated from each other so we can actually work together and then, of course, you know, use that and build the overall Caribbean platform for Carnival to grow and the, the whole idea that, you know, this is the, the center of Carnival culture. So I, I want to return to a couple of questions. Thank you, Kamal, for that. Um, 
because uh, the, the participation of everyone here is important to us. And we want to keep going to these questions for members of the public. So um, we have quite a few questions about creating an enabling environment for uh, potential innovations related to Carnival. Um, one person asked, the reaction speed of the private sector is, ex is, is exponentially faster than the public sector but it is the public sector that implements policies to protect carnival heritage. How do we ensure that the vulnerable heritage components of the festival remain protected as we undoubtedly move into a hybridized festival environment? I have always taken the responsibility for our culture in my own hands. I think, uh, you know, yes, what, she's, what the, 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 the person is saying is correct. Uh, that it falls both in public and private, but uh, I think it's a responsibility for each of us as citizens as well. Um, to, to continue from what Val is saying, I would want to add that it is also a consistent review, reassessment, and I, I use this, this phrase already, reimagination of those heritage components because we cannot escape the fact that the, the demographic uh, becomes younger in some instances, um, more discerning in others in terms of disposable income and what they like, uh, and, and in others, more exposed to international trends and therefore more demanding of something similar at home. So I, I do not think that we, we have to consider that aspects of our heritage will be given to a consuming public uh, the same way every time, but that their basic elements are safeguarded, but that the expression of those elements uh, keep up with the times. And I also want to, to very quickly go back on uh, the whole question of collaboration, because I think that we've limited it to the actual participation of or production of our individual carnivals and festivals. And I think that it is a bit more than that. Um, the, the whole question of the carnival footprint on the environment is an area that's broad enough that we can be collaborating on. When you come to festivals in the Caribbean, how environmentally friendly are we? What, what um, protocols do we have in place to limit uh, a negative uh, footprint on our territories. Um, the whole question of, of pricing and prices of aspects of our carnival, those are some broad areas, but very critical areas that we can also be having um, conversations on as well. Thanks, Carol. Um, I want to also ask a question that has come in from uh, one of our colleagues here at the IDB, Karina, and I'm going to direct it to Kamal. Um, does it have to be completely digital or completely in person? Isn't there a way to reduce crowd sizes, spread events over more days, adjust pricing to tweak the experience so we still get in the in-person experience since it is so appealing? Mm, interesting. Yeah, very good question. I mean, my, my view on it is, is really that streaming now becomes an additional uh, revenue stream and an, an, an add-on to the experience. Um, because you're going to have a percentage of the population, whether locally or internationally, that can't or won't come. You're going to have that. Um, so the streaming and the digital immersion won't replace the in-person product, but it will be an add-on um, that may satiate, you know, maybe 10, 15, 20% um, of what you used to have, you know, and help to bridge a gap um, in the short term. But that's really what we're looking at, help to bridge a gap in the short term and hopefully, in the medium term, that you know, add-on value that you're creating by having some kind of streaming element exposes your product to people that would never have looked at it in the first place. Um, because with the, you know, how the internet is and so on and so forth, you're able now to shoot that over to South Africa, to you know, uh, various places in Europe, and, and somebody can immerse in the digital experience and be like, hmm, this looks interesting. I actually want to check this out next year um, or the year after, whenever they're comfortable. And that gives you the opportunity, you know, to kind of, as we say in Jamaica, taste and buy. Um, so for me, what is important is that 
you still have to have some kind of you know in person experience because that is what brings energy you know when humans unite together um there's a certain kind of energy that you get um you know whether it is at a football match or you know church or whether it is at a festival or whatever it is that energy of humans coming together you can't really replicate that and because of that you're in a situation where you're saying well how do I broadcast that to the world? And that's actually what you want to show. And when you show that, that energy is what becomes what people are going to say, I want to be a part of that. So the digital streaming and technology won't replace in-person experience. It's an add-on that can add value. And hopefully if you do it right and you get all the right you know, publishing and copyright stuff started out, it can add an additional revenue stream to you. And it can so, engage your community and keep them engaged. Yes. Absolutely. So we, we, we're going to run out of time. I'm always so surprised at how quickly time passes in a forum like this. But I'm going to put you guys on the spot and ask you a question about the future. So the year is 2030. What does Carnival in your respective territory look like? And how is it different from what exists today in one minute? Carol, you're ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the oldest here. What am I getting to go? <laughs> I You're ready to go, go Carol. Towards? 2030. Um, in 2030, um, I see a green, clean crop over festival uh, that celebrates all aspects of uh, Barbadian heritage. Uh, I'm very strong about that. Um, again, that, that word reimagined on various platforms. And I see people all over the world participating in crop over, whether they're lovers of visual arts, lovers of music, and I'm specifically saying music as opposed to soca, whether they're lovers of Barbadian music, lovers of Barbadian art, uh, but lovers of Barbadian culinary arts, whether they like Barbadian literature, uh, all of those aspects. I see uh, people all over the world picking up a video game on the Crop Over Festival and becoming fully immersed in it and enjoying aspects of the festival in an alternative reality um, without necessarily having to travel. But for those who travel, they also get the same experience. Very Thank you, Carol. Yeah. Thank you, Carol. Yeah. Val. Val. I see the perfect blend of heritage as Carol said and technology. I see technology for us in Trinidad being able to change the shape of our road experience and change the actual route itself. I see the development of our festivals and a larger carnival experience. Maybe not even coming for one week, but people coming for a longer period of time and segments in between because there's more to see and experience. Thank you, Val. Kamal. So my vision of it actually um, is... is growing the footprint of carnival in Jamaica um, to much, much bigger than, than what it is today and getting participation from not only the Soka Calypso market, but our indigenous reggae dance hall um, and cultural markets and culminating a national festival like that where you have um, carnival as it would be expressed in Jamaica is not necessarily about for us Soka or Calypso, um, you know, or walk up or whatever. It is a coming together to celebrate each other and pageantry, right? So for me, you're going to have a space where those music genres of soca and calypso play, but you're also going to have a space where reggae and dancehall and ska and those kinds of things also play. When I went to Notting Hill Carnival, actually, you had a lovely blend of everything. You had the dancehall sound systems popping up on every corner um, with hundreds of thousands of people and the carnival bands marching around the road um, playing different styles of music, um, whether it is, as I say, you know, walk up or the soak or the calypso or whatever it is. And what I believe Jamaica, carnival in Jamaica is actually going to be is a melting pot of everything. Um, where people from all around the world are going to be able to get that fusion of the local indigenous Jamaican culture and also the Eastern Caribbean culture um, and the food, the doubles are there and the jerk chicken is over there and the flying fish is over there and, you know, those kinds of things. And you'll, you'll pro properly be able to immerse and then you broadcast that to the world 
um, and become immersed in that with 360 cameras. And then you can actually insert yourself into the carnival experience. Thanks, Kamal. Avashi, I'll give the final word to you. We've run out of time. I, I think what I'd like to see in Twente Theatre is really our creative and cultural industries being counted. It's very possible that they can become a new driver of economic growth in a very serious way. I think that a, they will be augmenting our traditional or maybe even replacing our traditional sun and sea tourism experience. I would really like hope to see the continued integration of smaller producers, communities engaged in this process, hub and spoke, more opportunities for inclusion, and of course, green and more environmentally sustainable. Thank you all. Thank you all for your ideas, for your time. Uh, Carol, Val, Kamal, and Vashti. So um, this right, has Dennis. been a very engaging and wonderful conversation that we can have about the future of our region. And just to point, pinpoint two very important points that were made here today. One is about Caribbean collaboration when we talk about our festivals and how we can strengthen them. Um, working together is important. And the second is about how we can supplement what we do in person with what we do online. So thank you so much for this. Um, we have been downloading our chat and there are many questions that we didn't have the time to answer, but we'll try to get answers to those of you who ask those questions. And we'll also be following up with some um, information from the IDB uh, related to what we discussed here today. Thank you again and Thanks stay with us thank as you, we continue Golda. to- Thank you everyone in the audience. Yeah, stay and safe. It's been great. All right, see y'all. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.